Welcome to The Rewind, an R News monthly podcast where we discuss various different topics in the Bohemian society. I'm your host, Jasmine Lundy. I'm your co host, Chime. I don't like eggs enough. I get the vibe. Hey, <laughs> let's put that on a shirt. Oh, by our last name. Yeah. yeah. This is The Rewind. <laughs> Welcome to The Rewind. You are tuned into episode five of our podcast. And this episode is gonna be all about the orange economy. Now we're your hosts, Janae Winter and Jasmine Lundy. But we have two amazing guests here with us, Jody Minnis and John Cox. Now we know you guys as you know really talented artists, but for the audience sake, Kind of tell us more of who you are and what you do. John, I'll pass it over to you first. Okay, so thank you very much for having me on the show. Yes. First of all, We're so excited to I appreciate it and the opportunity. Thank you very much. So I guess, geez, I have a couple of hats. So the one that is most relevant to where we are. So I'm the executive director for arts and culture for the Bahama Resort, which in a short, in in short just means that I along with my team are responsible for all of the visual art and all of the cultural and arts like capital A with a S programming um, that takes that takes place at the resort. Um, I'm also I have an art practice which I've had for almost 30 years now Um, so I'm I'm a practicing artist uh, and also I am the chairman of the board of directors for the National Art Gallery of the Bahamas. Mm-hmm. So, and a friend of Jody's, yes. which is most important. I should have led with that. <laughs> and I too am John's friend. <laughs> Good that we it. both think that. Yeah. <laughs> friends and vibes. Right. Um, so I am the exhibitions and programming director of Turin Gallery, which is a commercial art gallery as well. Yeah, you should come. <laughs> Um, I also have uh, an artistic practice, like John. It's not as prolific as his, but you know, he's working at it. Um, I'm also a art writer, so I write about contemporary um, Bahamian and Caribbean art. Um, and although this falls under the umbrella of what I do at Turn, I think it should be specified that I'm a curator as well um, of contemporary Bahamian and Caribbean art. Awesome. And you may notice that our set looks a bit different, a little fancy. I just want to shout out to Echo. Thank you so, so much for allowing us to shoot the rewind here. We are so grateful. We're surrounded by art. Talking about the orange economy, I mean, like, what better place to be <laughs> at? Okay? So, you guys, definitely make sure I come to Echo. They're always having events. Um, check out the art here. Beautiful art. And let's continue this discussion. Right, so as Janae mentioned, we are talking about the orange economy. So I would like for you both to tell me your definition of the orange economy. John, we'll start with you. So I'm sure the orange economy could be defined in a lot of different ways, but I think maybe the simple entry to it is the part of the economy that's informed by the the creative community, right? So anything... um, from the creative community, visual arts, design, performance, theater, um, you know, music, uh, and it's the it's the platforms that allow those practices to contribute to the overall kind of GDP, right? So, how much um, where commerce is influenced by the creative corner of the greater uh, community? Yeah, and Jody. I have the same definition. Um, I think it's important to say that the orange economy was looked at more closely because um, it was kind of this like invisible revenue for a long time. Mm-hmm. So persons weren't really quantifying it. Um, and it's hard to quantify cultural currency versus the, like the overall GDP, like John says. Um, but over the past, uh, maybe... I'm I'm young, so I don't really want to put a put a, a a number to it and erase person's work. But I think over time, you know, as more governments have been like looking at that specific revenue stream, we've been able to like define it um, more and see and look at the possibilities of what else can be extracted from this economy. Right. It, it also too is like a lot of times, um, the creative contribution was kind of seen as like a. Uh, like a non-tangible 
uh, uh, contribution, and I mean uh, something that you can't measure in dollars and cents. Yeah. And I think it was UNESCO um, yeah. at, that actually initiated the study that actually went in and started to research, well, how much money do artists make and how much does that contribute to uh, nation building and how much do musicians make and how much do people pay for, pay for tickets and yeah. how much do graphic designers dis, you know, charge for their services and so on and so forth. Yeah. And then I think what was discovered was that this contribution was a lot more significant, yeah. a lot more complex than people had imagined. Mm -hmm. um, and then people started to recognize that this orange economy was a real thing and that it became something that people could like mechanize uh, in their own organizations uh, to enhance things. So in 2015, I think we had a conversation here, um, and I didn't want to quantify it, cause, but I, 2015 was the, the year, and there's actually a book that was published by UNESCO um, with all of that data called The Orange Economy, and the PDF version is online if anybody wants to look for it. Oh, awesome. So yeah. we Googled, because we had to do some research about the orange economy, and what we found was basically the same thing that you both said. Mm -hmm. So it's such a broad economy. Yeah. And it, it has been around since the dawn of time. We just started like identifying it as the orange economy, but it, it's been here, mm -hmm. right? So we looked on Google, because Google has everything, <laughs> and we found the definition. So on Google, it says, the orange economy is a production model where goods and services have intellectual value because they are the product of ideas and expertise of their creators. And then the orange economy is also known as the creative economy. Mm -hmm. And like we said, it's so broad. There's so many things that fall in, under that. And John, you, like you said, you wear so many hats. And Jody, you also wear many hats. <laughs> so we're going to break down what all is included in the orange economy. So there are several categories. And the first we have is design and visual arts. Mm -hmm. And that's where you have your painting, your sculptures, photography, and the sorts. And in the Bahamas, we have really Some great, talented. listen. Yeah. I mean, we're looking we at you right now. Right, <laughs> but also outside of you both, we yeah. have some amazing artists who have been also been working with international celebrities mm -hmm. like Stanley Bab, who's also known on Instagram as Stanley, Stan Low Stan Photography. Yeah. And he photographer, he photog, he photographs. Photographs. <laughs> He photographs, thank you. thank you, celebrities like Portia Smith and so many others, yeah. right? And then we have Jamal Roll, mm -hmm. and he draws icon, like iconic yeah, photos. Really and he did some work on like Sydney, Sir, the late Sir Sidney Poitier, mm -hmm. and then Buddy Heal mm -hmm. and Shawnee Miller Weeble. Mm -hmm. And they are all our celebrities, yeah. our personal bohemian celebrities, I love that. right? Yeah. And then we have tourism and cultural heritage, which is where you would find like Junkanoo and tours around the Bahamas to maybe like forts and stuff and what have you. And then we have new media and this software, right? <laughs> <laughs> and that's the websites, the graphics, all of those things. Mm -hmm. And then we have performing arts, like theater, mm -hmm. dance, mm -hmm. which I love, mm -hmm. I love, love, love. And then we have music. That's a big bohemian thing oh, yeah. with songwriting. And in the Bahamas, we have amazing songwriters and musicians, such as Ronnie Butler. Mm -hmm. Then we have Tony McKay, who wrote a song called Exuma the Obey Man. And that particular song was actually uh, featured in a recent American film called Nope. Mm -hmm. And it was written by Oscar winning, an Oscar Emmy winner, Jordan Peele. Yeah. So that's a really big deal mm -hmm. because we are now like, I mean, we have ever been more so but in the uh, international stage, yeah. but for that to happen, I think that's a really big deal. And because mm -hmm. it's current, a lot of the young, younger generations, yeah. they got an appreciation for Bohemian music through that film. Mm -hmm. yeah. And then lastly, literary arts, which is where you have your book writing, magazine writing, etc. Mm -hmm. So it's a mouthful. <laughs> It's a mouthful. But it's good for the audience to know because like we said, you know, it's so vast. Some people just hear orange economy and they're like, okay, so what about it? Mm -hmm. But it's good to know that we have all these different areas, you know, and if you may find yourself falling under these categories, you're like, oh, well, I'm too a part of the orange economy because we have a lot of talented bohemians mm -hmm. who 
all under those factors that Jasmine just mentioned. So just carrying on with the episode, we wanted to really get in depth with our two guests here. So we have a few questions to ask you. Okay. Um, we want to get personal. We want to get. We, we want to know the people who are actually a part of this economy. So I'll ask Jody first. Um, one of my first questions I thought of, because I wanted to ask like interesting, not just boring, like tell me about yourself. That's fine. So <laughs> in your, in like the most pretentious way possible, you know, <laughs> very, I guess, conceited or condescending, like arrogant, uh, mm -hmm. whatever. Um, yes. Describe your art style or, you know, the way that you work. I want to hear it. Pretentious. <laughs> pretentious. Um, in the most pretentious way, mm. I am a multimedia interdisciplinary artist. Oh, I love that. Uh, <laughs> which all means the same thing, <laughs> actually. Uh, but yeah, so in my art form, I the idea is the driving force. So I uh, work with a few different concepts, and those concepts are um, executed by whichever medium I think fits best to translate the idea, if that makes sense. So um, if I want to relay a woman dancing, I may do that in a performance rather than a painting. Or if I want to um, you know, depict a flower, I would draw it rather than photograph it. So that's the way that I tend to go about my um, artistic practice. And it's changing now because uh, I have a job. Um, <laughs> so <laughs> I don't have as much Love. time mm -hmm. <laughs> to do certain things. So I'm, I'm in a phase, a stage now where I'm uh, just trying to be open to what the evolution of my, my practice looks like in this time of my life. Okay. John, we want to hear from you. <laughs> I've got to follow Jody. Uh -huh. I think, um, so I am a mixed media artist, um, not unlike Jody. Um, I just think of my artistic process as uh, solving problems. So I'm not wedded. Um, I'm not a custodian of any one discipline or another, but I, uh, do feel like I'm, uh, you know, versed in the things that are, that help me communicate effectively. So I typically make, I, I was trained in printmaking. Um, uh, I also have an illustration degree, which is kind of unusual. I don't think people would actually think that I do, but I do. Um, I make objects, installations, kind of like what Jody said, not to steal her answer, but I think <laughs> I need to kind of cut and paste her answer. Um, Cause I think we have a similar way of thinking about, about uh, making. Uh, work. Um, I'm I'm very inspired by collaboration, especially now as I'm older. Like I really, really am. I'm inspired by uh, doing things with other people. Um, John Beadle, who is a, a very good friend of mine, is a, and is also a mentor uh, of mine. Um, in my early days, when I first came out of art school, he and I were talking. And he said, you know, you should never approach anything that you are, never approach anything in your practice thinking that you can't, that there are limitations to what you could do because you can do anything you want to do. And anything that you cannot do alone, you can do it collaboratively. And so that's kind of a mantra that I uh, kept dear to myself. I feel very, very lucky because I have some very, very good friends who are very, very good artists. Uh, my 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 <laughs> heroes and uh, and also when I was a lot younger, I realized that all of my heroes needed to be younger than me, mm. and so wow. that's how I'm that's how I roll. So I have another question I want to ask. I know when briefly I kind of got, got into photography because I majored in journalism, but both of us did. Mm -hmm. But when I had my photography class, um, I started taking pictures. and I'm like, I kind of noticed like the world around me a little bit more. I kind of started seeing things a little bit more beautiful. I was looking at flowers. It's like, whoa. Like you just all of a sudden you poking yeah. at me. So I said that to say, how has art kind of changed your perspective and view of the world? Um, you know, maybe your outlook of social issues or even personally, how has art in you know multimedia, whichever way you do it, how has it changed your perspective and view? <laughs> um, I feel like me and John have the same brain. Uh -huh. <laughs> but I was gonna say that art for me, the foundation of an, any artistic practice is problem solving, which means that I can, I believe that there's a solution to any problem that arises in the world. 
So I go about my everyday, like, if this is a problem, I can and will find a solution because that's just how mm, my brain works. Wow. Um, so I don't, yeah, I get a bit um, prickly when people talk about things in ways in which they are stoic, like they're immovable, like this thing has to stay this way. I'm like, no, I could like make a painting and solve the, you know, world hunger or something. <laughs> <laughs> World peace. <laughs> World peace, you know. But, but uh, yeah, so I think art has helped me to keep like a foundation of or an anchor of anything is possible. And oh. if something doesn't exist in the world, I could create it to happen in the world. Um, and if, and like John said, if I can't do it by myself, then I know about 10 people who will, you know, band together and help me make this thing happen. So, I would say that, and then I also, I deconstruct a lot of everything. Um, so I really wanna know how things work, um, even if it's just like theoretical. Like, I, if I wanna know how, how a government works, I will do the research and figure out how it works. So if I wanna know how, you know, to put on makeup, like eyelashes, then I will, <laughs> you know, figure that out myself. Uh -huh. So um, I think art gives you a good um, conceptual and theoretical, like, foundation to move through the world in whichever way you see fit. Yeah. Um, I think that for me, my practice or the, the kind of perspective that um, my practice has kind of given me is that, you know, you can, art makes the impossible possible. Yeah. I you know I what I'm agree. saying? Like it just, it just, me. it just yeah. doesn't. <laughs> Listen, wow. um, it, it just does, right? I mean, yeah. things, things, things work. Um, you know, art doesn't. I say things work, but I mean, I think I think that's the great thing about it. Art doesn't have to make like literal sense. I think yeah. that sometimes we try to like rush to conclusions, and sometimes art just uh, whether it's music or painting or or dance or the whole the, all of it, the best of it kind of informs and takes us to a place that maybe sometimes is very uncomfortable. Yeah. Um, uh, oftentimes a place where uh, these are so many aspects of, of life in general, just kind of want to be so logical and, and make sense and be quantifiable and, you know, this and that, but there's so much um, artwork um, that inspires me that just kind of feels like it lives in this space of uncertainty. Mm -hmm. And it's just so powerful because it feels like it enables people to um, enables people to 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 kind of just reckon with uh, things that are very difficult to understand uh, and difficult to comprehend. Um, but art, the artistic practice and process makes it feel like you know it, it allows people a gateway to kind of feel like okay, well you know being a being in the process is probably as good as yeah. uh, knowing what the answer is. Yeah. For you know? me, what I'm comprehending from both of your answers is that maybe art is like spiritual. Like you can feel a spiritual oh, yeah. connection because you said it makes things that you would think would be impossible, impossible. possible. And then you were saying, Jody, that um, it helps you. What were you saying? Anyway, <laughs> you were both saying like uh, the same thing. And mm -hmm. it sounds yeah. to me like art is this spiritual thing and then when you don't really know like in religion for example when you can't really find an answer you would like give it to a higher power that's what it's sounding like art does yeah it's a bit of a transformation right yeah. it's, a, it's, a, it's a lot like it's a lot like a faith you know mm -hmm. in a way um and i say that i cringe a little bit when i say that because <laughs> i don't want that to get too specific yeah. and, mm -hmm. and, and you yeah. know and like yeah. boxed in right but there is a process that i think that a lot of people um struggle with like you know like just looking at certain things i like look at these paintings behind you so like, what is that supposed to mean mm -hmm. and you're like what do you mean what is that supposed to yeah. mean it doesn't mean anything and it means yeah. everything right. wow. at the same time yes. right yeah. so you know um I think the more you know, the more you the don't. suggestions become more specific um, or more, you know, not specific, but more contextualized. Mm -hmm. But like, as Jody says, you you just become more in awe of like how vast everything is yeah. uh, and how how meaningless yeah. knowing things actually is. Yeah. And I was also going to say that I think 
art forces us to be present, like to properly engage with it, you have to be present. And being present is not something that we, is not, you think you're present when you're like in conversation with people yeah. and I'm you know, like you out. think yeah. you're yeah. pale. Yeah. Um, Everywhere but when you watch a performance or you, like, if you watch a theatrical performance mm-hmm. and you feel, or with music or you watch mm-hmm. dancing, like, and you feel the yeah. emotion that's coming through, it's because you're actually present in that moment and you're engaging with all of your senses, which then creates, um, which translates to you a response in your body. And then that then feels spiritual because it does. Um, wow. you are just doing what you're supposed to do in your everyday life, which is to be present. Wow. You know? And to connect. Yeah. yeah. No, it feels very much so. I mean, I'm, I was thinking about it just recently, like how like the best art will kind of like move you to tears like it makes you emotional yes. right yeah. and yeah. i and i was just thinking you know i guess i don't know like i think maybe it's like esoteric or whatever but i think like how grateful i am for every artist yeah like ever yeah for just doing that when you could mm-hmm. listen to like a lyric in a song or like like go into a, a space and look at an installation or you know, just look at a good piece of design or hear somebody talk about their practice and it like it's like, wow. Mm-hmm. It is you know what I mean? Like Not it makes it make it makes yeah. it makes the day worth the while. Yeah. And yeah. I I'm not saying that it doesn't happen in mm-hmm. in other areas, right. but I just don't know. <laughs> I'm saying <laughs> yeah. but certainly in the creative <laughs> sphere, yeah. right. like I yeah. am moved yeah. by the creative sphere. Yeah. Mm-hmm. I'm not necessarily I, moved by you know other things yeah. but definitely like mm-hmm. and i you could see it you mm-hmm. know even my good friend jody just she didn't well maybe she will get to it she curated a show for a turn um of a very very good friend of mine hano schmid and i don't know if you named that show or he did, did whatever and the show is just called in this house there is a home even that makes me want to cry and i'm I just like wow like what an amazing because it's so it's so um yeah. It, it it just like fits like the way that this artist thinks about what he's doing and his practice and the material and the process and the like there's just this kind of like um honesty with the with the work and i'm just like wow like i get chills thinking about that mm. like i don't get chills thinking about <laughs> the Thanks. news right you know what i mean oh, and other I things like that, that. <laughs> You yeah. know, like, Science. I don't, I just yes. don't <laughs> really, like, I'm not really <laughs> like, sure. Like, yeah, yeah right. I didn't start getting don't it. Ask me about that. You know? yeah. <laughs> yeah. I can hear and I can the feel passion. the passion. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. I love that. I would like to know where is this passion coming from? Where did it stem yeah. from? Stem from? How did it start? So we can start with Jody. Where, how did you become the artist that is Jody? Uh, well, that's a good question. Um, it was something actually it's so funny because i i saw an artist marlon hunt um i remember being my mom is an architect i should say that um and she used to draw with me as a child so whenever um like she would be at a desk like drawing and i'd be like mommy i want to draw and she would just like you know turn around and draw with me so i always had that practice of like making with her in my free time um or if i'm like mommy i bored and this is you know pre um, game devices and stuff, she would always have like paper and pen for me. So I just would sit down and draw all the time to the point where her colleagues at work would save their paper for me. Oh, so, so they're like, okay, the kids come in. Well, Jody has really? all this paper for you. Um, so yeah, it was always something that I just like innately felt like I needed to do. And then the passion stemmed from just, I think, being in college and just seeing the possibilities of moving from the place of I can't or Mm -hmm. I don't know to oh my god I did Mm -hmm. and then having that happen like over and over and over again Mm because it's one thing for people to say well I need you to like and Heino Schmidt who um John just mentioned um he was my drawing professor and he was like okay well I need you to draw you know this cup I'm like what (laughs) he's like yeah draw this cup the like um get the value of it and this is my first time doing something like that. And I'm like, I don't know how to do this. And my brain is breaking and I'm having a panic attack and I just don't know what's, you know, how do I take something that I see related right. to my hand and then put it on paper? Mm-hmm. 
And when you do that, like the first two, three times, you're like, oh my God, <laughs> like, mm-hmm. what is even happening? Mm-hmm. And so it's just knowing that, and I think that's where my I could do anything thing comes from is because if I could do that and it looked in real life how it looks on my paper, then I could do anything. You can't tell me I can't do nothing. Yeah, true. And what about you, John? Um, it comes from a lot of different places, right? I think it depends on, I guess, the mood or the, the, that I'm in at the time when you ask me the question. But like, I feel like it, it comes from a lot of different spaces. I know for me, it's interesting that Jody says that um, she is inspired by her mother, who's an architect. Mm-hmm. So, so, you know, and architects are in the built environment. Right. And so my father was a civil and structural engineer, and so wow. he worked with a lot of architects. And I think I took it for granted, right? So mm-hmm. oftentimes in previous interviews, people would ask me the same question. I would say, oh, it was the house that I grew up in, and people were like, that makes no sense. Uh, but it makes complete sense because I think that we don't, we take for granted the environments that we're in mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. In, in a major way and how they affect us affect us like i think if we are just aware of the effect that the environment has on us whether it's positive or negative it's it it helps shape you right because a lot of people are informed their or develop their art practice from some kind of trauma or some Mm -hmm. kind of negative Mm -hmm. uh uh, scenario right Mm -hmm. um and that helps them have the most beautiful and successful practice and some people it comes it's like positive creates more positive or positive creates effective and some people it's like negative creates effective and positive um but for me i think you know my my i grew up in this house that was like a like a mid-century modern house which was which was designed by an architect like of note who was like a recognized architect you know and i think most people Mm -hmm. don't know i mean maybe you guys know but other people if you said can you name me like five architects they were like like I know what an architect is, <laughs> yeah. but I right. could not name one. Yeah. Right. And these yeah. people are designing wow. the mm-hmm. bathrooms that you, yeah. you know, use every day. And how big is your bedroom? And how big is the, the office that you sit in? And you know, like uh, spaces like that we're in now. Somebody had to decide. Somebody yeah. made. Somebody made a decision, and we're dwelling within this decision. An amazing and decision. And so, <laughs> I always just kind of felt like this hyper awareness mm-hmm. came from I think subconsciously because I didn't like my house when I was little because it was very unusual like it Mm -hmm. just felt like I can't tell what's inside and outside like I can't (laughs) tell is this the patio or is this the living room because Mm -hmm. the walls would like they had these like receding pocket glass doors that would like disappear Mm -hmm. they were just a glass door but the way they would they would like slide into the wall and uh, so my father worked with this architect and because they were so into what they were doing, they kind of realized that they could make this. Yeah. They could collaborate. Yeah. And do this really amazing thing architecturally and from an and from a structural engineering perspective. And so the house had no air conditioning. It had no this and that. So it had all of the spoils that mm-hmm. like other houses that I like naively were like, oh, I want my house to have carpet and AC and whatever. This house had none of those things. Mm-hmm. And so it wasn't until like I got like older, I was like, wait a second. Like, this is actually Continuous, interesting. Yeah. Or I learned about other architects, and I was like, right. "What? Well, this kind of looks a lot like the house that was in here. And mm-hmm. so, like, I came to art, my creative process through, like, building. I was always very, um, didn't feel like I had a very good sense of, like, the traditional academic pathways I that people would that. get into art. Like, uh-huh. being able to, like, draw well, mm-hmm. like, render. Mm-hmm. I always struggle with that. I was like, man, I can't, I can't. <laughs> translate it as well as other people are translating it but if you said like can you make this table like i was like i could definitely make the table wow. and i could make the drawings that would show you how to make the table wow. yeah. and then after a while i recognized like jody said that Heino told her if you could draw the cup you mm-hmm. could do anything yeah. then i realized well if i could make the table i could pretty much do anything right yeah. you know what i'm saying so it kind of felt like it all leads to one place yeah so I kind of want to know, like, your mind, like, how it works when you guys are <laughs> creating a piece. Like, what is, what is that like? Like, what is the journey? Like, whatever piece it may be, because I know you guys do multimedia. So kind of walk us through that process. You, you, you don't have to give us all your tea, all the details, but I kind of want to get into that. Like, how, what's the process like for you all? Jody, you can go first. Um, 
Oh. <laughs> <laughs> I think it depends. Like, it, it's changed for me over the years, obviously. Mm. But um, I know I am a bit more um, formulaic now because my time is very small. Can um, you repeat that? Like, form, like, I have a formula to things. Okay. Now, so how was it in the past? Um, kind of, I, I think I, I did a lot of, th I leaned into that, like, oh, how I feel kind of mm, thing. And okay. I realized that's not sustainable. Okay. Um, so, yeah, now I'm like, I will take 50 photos, go through the 50, mm. you know, like that kind of way is okay. what I operate now. But um, after I've, like, made a decision about, like I said, idea and concept comes first. So I'm like, right. okay, what do I want to talk about this? What is the best way to communicate that? Okay, let's say painting. Cool. What are you gonna use to then like illustrate in the painting? Because paintings to me are like stories. I feel like you have to constantly be like every time you come back to a painting, you have to like read another part of the story. So I'm like, okay, well, what characters are in my story? So on and so on. So I find that, do that, have the drawing on um, the canvas or paper or whatever, and then when I paint. I just let the paint tell me wow. when to. I will. <laughs> <laughs> so no, but that yeah, I, because uh, there's a limitation in everything you do. There's a limitation, yeah. and some limitations you could push, and some will like you will hit the wall. Yeah. And I think the thing about being a painter specifically is that you know oil paint will do what you want it to do, and then it won't. So there's a point where I just let the oil paint stop, or like I make a mark, and I'm like I really want to go into that, but some like this thing blended with this thing in a way that created something that I couldn't do by my own hand. So I just let it happen. And that's how I try to um, approach my paintings now, just with limitation and restraint. And before we go to John, Jody, you said that you let the paint tell you what to do. Yeah. In some research, I actually saw that another artist said that he does the exact same thing. He allows the material, the woods, the paint, whatever mm -hmm. he uses to tell him what to do. And I was like, wow. Yeah, no, it's also amazing. Yeah, it's a collaboration. It's still, yeah. it's, it it's still a collaboration because mm -hmm. the, the paint is coming with what all the paint has. And I know that oh. this is going to sound very heady mm. to people. <laughs> but yeah, like it's just like cooking. Like Onions will only do certain things if you put them with certain things. So you can't like make a potato out of an onion. So I can't make like, I can't make oil paint work in the way that I would, would. And then mm -hmm. if I do want to, that's a whole other process. And then I have to determine whether that process is necessary for what I want to communicate in this particular piece. So yeah. Everything just feels so profound. I know, like, <laughs> I I'm just know. absorbing this all. But John, I want to hear from you as well. Yeah, and I just feel like I want to like respond to what Jody said because uh -huh. I think it's so brilliant. I mean, she, I think you observe other people's practice, right? So what she's talking about with the material being a collaborator, it is collaborating. You're collaborating with the material. Um, whether or not it's a successful collaboration is a different <laughs> story. And I think when that, those open lines of, for lack of a better word, communication between you and the material happen. I mean, Jody operates with a sense of mastery that when you look at things, you, you, people who are, are very, very good at what they do make what they do seem effortless. Like not, not, not like easy in the sense that it's like, 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 cheap in the sense of like effort but like there's a degree of like wow like can you imagine like this person is doing what they're doing with this like jody does it Heino does it. a bunch of people i can name like a yeah. thousand people who yeah. do it right but like there's a degree to which what she was talking about like you understand what the possibilities of the material are and then you let the material do what it can do yeah but i remember one time in my dad's office there was a guy a uh, a uh, a uh, 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 carpenter in there and he needed to cut a curve and this is like a roundabout way of answering your question because i think metaphorically this is how i wish or I, how i aspire my practice to be right like i don't need like perfect conditions in order for things to be perfect right like mm -hmm. you just need to be like if you you just need to understand your environment and get it done yeah. this guy had to cut a curve out of a piece of off the corner of a piece of wood sorry of a corner of a piece of wood. And normally you would do that technically with a jigsaw, with a right. blade that has like a, a saw that has like a single small blade. 
that goes up and down very fast and it can curve through the wood. And he didn't have that. He had a circular saw, which is a saw that has a very different mechanism, a blade that's quite long yeah. and doesn't, is not very maneuver, maneuverable. And I saw this guy just angle the corners off this piece of wood. He just like kept, mm -hmm. and he basically shaved a perfect corner off of this piece of wood with a tool that was not designed wow. to do that. Mm -hmm. And I was like, wow, like that feels like my practice, like my everything I approach, mm -hmm. I feel like sometimes in, a, in the most beautiful way, I'm not designed to actually do this. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And this is the thing that is going to make the, the object that I create unique. And I used to spend a lot of time thinking about the imperfections of my work and going, yeah. oh, this is, this is not good. Or I look at so-and-so's work and, oh, they do and this. The finish. And, oh, the, the finish <laughs> yeah. isn't like this. And it took me a while because I'm a lot older than everyone in this environment right now. Um, but I also take a, a message from other people who are older than me. And I was like, well, you know, this is actually your work. Mm -hmm. It takes you a while to recognize, like, who you are. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Because creatively, a lot of people try to be other people. Right. Oh, I want to be like this person. But you're not yeah. that Oh, I want to be yeah. this singer. Oh, right. I want my work yeah. to be like this person. And you're never going to be that other person. Right. Yeah. And never. why should you? You shouldn't want to be. Right. right. And so the process is, I don't even remember what your question was, but I was just like responding <laughs> to sorry. Jody's answer, which was amazing. But you guys talk about it so beautifully, you know, the yes. collaboration between you and the, the paint or the work. But what happens when that collaboration ain't working out? Like, you know, what do you do to navigate that process? Or you come up with like mental blocks or you're struggling to finish a piece. Like, how do you guys overcome that? I just leave it alone and do something else. <laughs> just walk away? <laughs> yeah. yeah. You might need makes to leave sense. it alone. It makes it makes sense to not to not um force it. To mm. not to not force the romantic idea that oh you should be making work and whatever. Wow. I remember when the pandemic happened, everyone was like, Oh, everyone has so much time at home, you should be yeah. making so much work. I was like, No, that was I'm, a lot of pressure. I'm actually yeah. like afraid yes. that the world is ending. I don't yes. really think I want to be making work right yeah. now. Yeah. Like, what do you yeah. mean I should be hustling? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. You wow. know? Um mm -hmm. so I think it you just have to let it be. Sometimes yeah. you you know, some yeah. sometimes people will say to me, Oh, how long does it take you to make that painting? And I said, well, there's two answers. Like, how long would it take for me to make it again? Yeah. That I've already yeah. done to make yeah, a copy yeah. of it? Uh -huh. I could do that super fast. Right. Okay. But how long it actually took Jason Bennett to make the painting that's over your head? I don't know. It might have yeah. taken him five years to make that. Yeah. Or he might have been inspired in a weekend and made mm -hmm. it. You yeah. know? So it, it definitely does not, a, it's not a, um, a clear answer that's that's the beauty of it i yeah. feel like that's the beauty of how impossible it is to follow yeah is what makes it unique right because mm -hmm, if it becomes otherwise then it becomes systematic systematic and robotic and then you could almost tell when you when tell. the magic is not there because mm -hmm. i think sometimes wow. you yeah it's that thing i think when you because there's an idea uh, in your head of what this thing looks like that doesn't exist anywhere else but your head so you're trying to make the thing in front of you be the thing in your head. And the tension is in that translation. But if you then, you know, divorce yourself from the thing in your head, be present with what's in front of you and say, oh, actually, and that takes, it's, that takes some time for me specifically. So that's why I leave things alone. Because then once I divorce myself from like an expected outcome, I could come back to it, see it for what it is and be like, oh, I actually just need to like, do this. Uh, okay, it's done. Come with and fresh then, eyes, right? And mm -hmm. then and then move forward. Um, but you could, yeah, you could tell, and it's just, and I think too. Sometimes we we're pressured um, to. I think art should be art. Mm. I I just that's Put it on a shirt. Clean and simple. Put it on a shirt. <laughs> Clean yeah, and yeah, simple. Yeah, art should like, be art. You could tell when I think art for the sake of expression, mm -hmm. art for the sake of like solving a problem, mm -hmm. art for the sake of something that is just like. This thing doesn't need to be in the world, but I think it ha should have a place in the world, so I will make it. Um, I think that should be a thing because then you could tell art that's made for profit, which is not a problem. Mm -hmm. um, but I think I work in a vein of like, I want my art to be that. I don't want to lose the mysticism of it. Um, and when you try to marry the two is when you get like that force and that creative block and you could tell. Mm -hmm. It almost sounds to me like communicating with an actual person 
So when you're having tension and you're not seeing eye to eye, you're like, you know what? Just give me some space. <laughs> well, I gotta go. <laughs> right. Uh, let's let's revisit this tomorrow yeah, when yeah. we're both in a better Head place. Space. Right. Yeah. So it sounds like you're actually interacting with another being. Yeah. I wow. love the therapeutic nature and the way that you guys describe the process because someone like I say that because as someone I actually came here. I don't know if John remembers saying, but I came here for an art class back in February. And I struggled so hard because I overthink a lot yeah. and I could not, like, I couldn't get it. And that was the purpose of me coming here. Like, I knew, like, that I would have that experience because I know the type of person I am. And I wanted to push myself to stay in art class. I wanted to leave, like, an hour through. No. <laughs> I even started to cry because I'm like... You cried? No, not like, oh. not like tears came down, but right. you know, like when you're just so frustrated because you're the type of person who normally gets it and you don't. And I know that art would bring me to that point. So hearing you guys talk about just let it flow. Like, I'm like, how, <laughs> like, it's, there, it's, how? <laughs> there's a word like we, like we use the word rigor. Yeah. Yeah. Right? And that's something that I feel like a lot of artists will refer to, you know, um, and I think it's it's okay for it to be hard. Mm -hmm. It's kind of sometimes it's beneficial. Like art needs to make you cry a little mm -hmm. because it's worth a while. You know, uh, teachers teachers make art students cry. Yeah. I can imagine. Not on purpose, <laughs> right? But right. Um, it happens. And I think oftentimes when it does happen, people remember those moments. Yeah. You know. Yeah. You have. I've been. I don't think I've ever made anybody cry, but I've certainly been in classes <laughs> where other people have broken down and wow. sometimes it's just like because the instructor is just, to just asking questions too they're yeah. just asking questions mm -hmm. and they go like i'm not trying I to hurt, get yeah. under your skin i'm just asking you questions. and yeah. i think just the revelation of the questions is like yeah. wow like it just undoes how twisted up sometimes you get creatively and then you kind of get out of your own way and just yeah. the the kind of that same crying is like that emotion is not unlike the emotion that I was talking about earlier, mm -hmm. when you like hear the the lyric in the song and it like gives you chills, like it's the mm -hmm. it's the realization, it's the connection that yeah, causes yeah. that to happen. Yeah. Um, and sometimes it's embarrassing. Like, oh, people are thinking this and that, and usually nobody yeah. is thinking what you're thinking. Yeah, they're probably holding back tears. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah, I love that. So. Our producers are, te is, are telling us that, you know, it's time to wrap up. That's Even though I want to talk more, but, you know. <laughs> right. so, okay, so <laughs> we've been enjoying the conversation no. so far, and we're actually going to have two episodes on the, the Orange Economy. So for our viewers, stay close. And we also want to talk about, like, the NFTs, what intellectual property is, and all of the sorts in episode two. So for now... Thank you so much for joining us, to our audience, and check us out in episode two. This is The Rewind.